Yeah. I don't know where my musicians are, but they're my singers. They're coming right now. Um, you have to admit, the platform just looks a little unusual. Unusual is the best word for it today. Of course, we're here enough uh, to have our children's uh, super church, which is a kids' crusade, Monday through Thursday. And so we've been working on getting our props together, and uh, we've got some awesome characters. I don't know if the characters are the people playing the parts or the parts that people play. Um, <coughs> But uh, we've got a lot of good help, and oh, in a little bit we're going to have just a little tiny taste of a small part of what's going to happen, and there are several people that are going to be coming up, and we'll do that when we take our offering in a moment. There's a song that we used to sing when I was growing up in the church, and it was Jesus breaks every feather. How many remember that song? We sang that. And uh, when I was a kid, of course, I didn't know what a feather was. I just sang it. Uh, most kids are singing, you know, he breaks a feather. He, you know, you, you, don't know, you don't know what it means. Uh, it's not a word we tend to use anymore, but the word feather means a chain. Uh, he breaks a chain. Amen. And just this past week, I came across a song. Uh, it started out as a black gospel song, and it moved over to Christian contemporary, but it reminded me of Jesus Breaks Every Feather because it was the exact same message that was in that old song that we used to sing. And so I'm going to open with it. I know you don't know it, but it's so easy that you'll figure it in no time flat. There, well, maybe. There is power
That's the old way. You can break every chain. It doesn't matter what binds a person. It doesn't matter if it's alcohol. It doesn't matter if it's uh, drugs. It doesn't matter if it's pornography. It doesn't matter what the things are that chain us down. When we come to the cross, Jesus has the power to deliver. Amen. 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 At this time, we are going to have those that are going to help us this morning uh, come on up. You know who you are and where you belong.
small, they'd be struck dead and they'd be drug out. They'd attach a rope to their legs so they could drag them out. Do you know they put the bells on the rope so they could tell they were still alive in there and moving around? But you know what? There was a time when Jesus hung on the cross and the rail was fed in twain. The Bible says from the top to the bottom of the earth. And that's why you and me can walk right into the presence of the King and let him know what we need. We don't have to tell somebody else. We don't have to wait for somebody else to take our need to him. We can walk right into his presence. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Page 89. Say glory to his name. Page 89.
healing. Amen. Hallelujah. The blood still abates. Praise the Lord. Amen. Our children are welcome to go to children's church this time. Of your wrist. 
You've never felt the roll of the ship that was torment and agony to your ankles and wrists. You've never been starved for water and begged and cried in vain. You've never been chained to people who died on each side of you. You don't know what freedom is. He knew what freedom was. It makes me think about when Jesus made the statement, the person who has forgiven the most loves the most. And why would that be? Simply because they understand what freedom is. Freedom isn't a mystery to them. Freedom is priceless and precious to them. This morning, I'm having a little bit of complications here. Maybe I turned it the wrong way. Let's try it this way. I was having some complications here. Still am. Let's do it this way. See, that's the beauty of a Bible or a book. You don't have to worry about turning it all kinds of different directions. This morning, if I was going to have a text, it would simply be John chapter 8, verse number 36. I'm not going to read a lot of scriptures this morning. Um, this evening, we will have a lot of scriptures. And our messages go together from last Sunday, this Sunday, and tonight. But it simply says, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. This morning I'm going to preach a sober, sobering message. It's a difficult message. It's not a fun message. It's a hard message message. I figured out what my problem was. I'm doing good now. <laughs> if I was going to give this a title, it would be The Death of a Collective Conscience. The Death of a Collective Conscience. See, last week here at our church, I preached about what the basis or foundation of freedom was. The foundation of liberty. And the foundation of liberty can be more than one thing, we said. For some people, the foundation of liberty, their personal liberty, is force. I'm bigger than you. I'm stronger than you. I will have liberty to do what I want, and you can't do anything about it. That's all good until there's somebody bigger than me that comes along, and they have the same opinion that I have, and then it doesn't work so well. So most people's foundation for freedom is found in law. And that's what we have here in the United States of America. There are laws that are designed to help assist your freedoms. But we said that even laws can be manipulated and laws can have problems if they're not uh, administered evenly and if they're not obeyed by people, then laws do not bring you freedom. And then there is a freedom that is found through grace in Jesus Christ. And as I was contemplating this, I thought, well, it's kind of important to go a little bit farther here because how is it that we have liberty because of grace? And it has to do with the fact that God works through your conscience and you begin to have a desire from the inside of you to do the thing that is right. So this evening, we're going to look at the role of the conscience and how you develop a Christ-like conscience. Christ-like conscience. But we're going to take it a little bit farther because I want to look at our nation this morning. Last week I preached on freedom because July 4th was coming up. And this week I preached on freedom because July 4th just passed. But both ways, it's a good time to do it. In America, something has begun to happen, and we are eliminating God from the national conversation. It's a little bit uncomfortable when you bring up religious views and convictions. In fact, if somebody asks you why you're against something, and you say, well, I'm a Christian, and I'm against it, then they write you off like your basis for an opinion does not count. You know, well, that's your conviction. That's your belief. Uh, and don't bring that in. Don't try to use that to control other people. 
you keep that to yourself, that's where religion belongs, in a closet. Bring out the homosexuals, throw in the Christians. That's forward, but it's true. But when we eliminate God from a national conversation, we begin to see the death, or we begin to lose the conscience that undergirds a nation's liberties and undergirds a nation's freedoms. And as the national consensus of a conscience begins to disappear and it begins to fade away, then we go back to where everybody starts doing what's right in their own eyes. There's no consensus of what's right and what's wrong. So if Dr. Jack Kevorkian thinks that it's okay to start killing all grannies, that's okay. That's what he thinks, so he does what he thinks. And if this person over here thinks it's okay to break into your car because you just went to, uh, down there to see the fireworks and you had something there you wanted, well then he's going to do it. And people start doing whatever it is that benefits themselves because a national consensus of a conscience is missing. Now, usually when we think of a conscience, we think of our own personal conscience. And the Holy Spirit can convict you through your conscience. And you can say, that is wrong. This is right. And we can get some direction through our personal conscience. Our personal uh, recognition that there is something that is right and there is something that is wrong. But not everybody's conscience works equally, do, do they? No. And the same is true when it comes to community conscience or a collective conscience. So let's just consider how beautiful a community or a collective conscience can be. Uh, since a conscience kind of directs you on what's right or wrong, uh, and that works from within individuals, we have families. <laughs> families have a inner sense of what's right and wrong within that family unit. And so the kids might know that it's not right to throw your garbage on the floor in your house. You don't have to say when you wake, they wake up in the morning, the rule today is you do not throw garbage on the floor because it's an unspoken rule because it comes from within. When a family is healthy and there is a community conscience that works in it, you don't have to have a lot of rules. Well, me and Trevor, we've been married for how many years now? More than we like to admit, huh? 16. 16. That's more than I like to admit. Although I'm glad I've been married for 16 years. I just hate to admit it's been that long. <clears throat> Me and Treva do not have to sit down and construct rules for us. Okay, Treva, the rule is you can't just go out with any other fellow you want to. Now, we've never sat down and read a list of rules like this. And, and don't just stay away without calling me and show up at, at 3 in the morning. And, and we don't have rules like this that happens in our house. Why? Because in our home, the law does not dominate our home. Conscience dominates our home. We have a collective conscience. And so we don't have to have the restrictions of all of the rules that happens. Now, when kids are little... And they don't really have a good sense of your collective conscience that you're trying to uh, construct inside of them. There's more rules for them, isn't there? Okay, and so when children are little, throw the law on them. <laughs> but as they get a little bit older and they begin to understand right and wrong and you have helped sculpt and shape their conscience, then you don't have to say things anymore. That's the beautiful thing about raising children. It's only horrible for a time. And then it's just not as bad after that. But there is a time that it's terrible. And that terrible time is when people can't comprehend within themselves what the right and wrong thing is. But when you understand a collective conscience, then things improve. Now, are you following me? Yeah. You understand what we're saying? Because this is kind of outside the norm of what we usually talk about in church. I mean, I've never heard a sermon about the collective conscience. It sounds kind of new agey, Brother Matthews. Better watch out. <laughs> but the more a collective conscience diminishes, the more laws have to be enacted. There are books that have been written about boundaries. 
Now, it's a tragedy, but it's true. There are homes where abuses and liberties are taken that never should be taken. And somebody ends up bearing the brunt of that. And so then Dr. I think it's Henry Townsend and somebody else uh, constructed a series of books about boundaries in relationships. And you know what boundaries in relationships is? It's law. Boundaries in relationships says you can't cross this line because if you do, then I ain't putting up with it anymore and I'm walking out. We're not having this in this home anymore. I have to draw lines. I have to make laws. That happens in unhealthy marriages. Unhealthy marriages. And hopefully, if there are boundaries and laws that have to be put in place in something that's unhealthy, you hope that that brings health and a sense of right and wrong back in it and that things can be healed and improved. But it's certainly not the way you want to live the rest of your life. So that is the way conscience works, even in the community of our home. And there is a conscience that is at work in nations as well. Collective conscience. An understanding of right. An understanding of wrong. Now, just because you have a nation doesn't mean everybody's on board with a collective conscience. Okay? Just because you have a family, it doesn't mean every child is on board with the collective conscience. And every once in a while, there has to be the rod of correction because they are bucking the system. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a consensus in general. So in America, we've had general consensus of what is right and what ought to be and what should never be. That is the conscience of our nation. And it was that collective conscience, that collective awareness of there is things that are right and there are things that are wrong that fueled the anti-slavery movement in America. See, when Bishop Wabash was young and he was put on a Portuguese slave ship, England had already abolished slavery, but the United States of America had <coughs> And there was a consensus among people, this is not right, this ought not to be. And because there was a consensus that arose from the nation, slavery was abolished in America. That is the beauty of what conscience can do within a nation. It can steer it in the right direction. That's what we want to have happen in a nation. We want conscience to steer uh, a nation in the right direction. The civil rights movement in America where we said, women are not trash. Some of them might be trashy, but they're not trash, <laughs> okay? Uh, uh, and if a person is a person of a particular color, they are not to be looked down on over somebody else. There's no superior color. It's equal. And a collective conscience arose in the United States of America that said, this should not happen. Do you realize that those conscience, those ideals, arise out of the scriptural principles? God is not a respecter of persons. And so why would we be a respecter of persons? The scriptures undergirded the consensus that happened within our nation. Child pornography laws. There is a national consensus in America that says... It is wrong for you to abuse a little kid. It's tragic, but in the news, this past week, my wife was the one that told me about it. Uh, there was a homosexual couple that adopted a child. How old was he, Trevor? Six months old or something? Oh, they, they got him the moment he was born. Okay, and he ended up on, they ended up on the cover, was it Time Magazine? Oh, it was in Australia, that wasn't Time Magazine. Get the story straight, Singleton. That's what happens when you use a story that's not your own. Okay, but they ended up in some national publication about how wonderful it was that this homosexual couple was able to adopt a child, because it used to be you couldn't adopt a child, that that was the case. But they were busted, because they were pawning that child off for child sex. 
and they were using this child for pornographic things. And so now, that you don't hear that in the news very loud, do you? Because that would kind of make people a little bit queasy. There is a national consensus against that. And we've opened up the door where that could be a possibility in that particular area. But there is a consensus that says some things are simply wrong and should not happen. Now in America, we still have some sense of a national conscience, but it's eroding. It's fading. It's the death of a national conscience. Really, to say it's the death of a national con conscience might be a little too strong if you want to be honest. It might be the transitioning of a national conscience which is a death. It's a death. So now, we have areas that are very, very, well, contentious anymore. You see, any laws that we have in America that govern abortion are put there on the basis of conscience. You ought not take a baby that could be born tomorrow and jam something in the back of its skull to kill it. Okay, but then if that's true, well, what if we just back it up three weeks earlier than that? And then we jam something in its skull and kill it. Is that okay? Oh, this is a that we this is very difficult in the national conscience. Well, what if it's what if it's only however many weeks old, but some at that age have survived? Then can we kill it? Well, right now you can, by the way. But we wrestle with this under the premise of, should this be? Should this child be born at this age and live, but this one we can kill it because it hasn't come out of its mother's womb yet? Why do we have this fight in America? It's because something has happened to the national collective conscience of America. Something has happened. Something is changing. What about legalizing drugs? Did you think you'd see the day when they legalize marijuana? Well, if you can legalize marijuana, why not legalize something a little bit uh, appealing beyond that? I mean, if it's going to bring in taxes, don't they all bring in taxes if you legalize all of them? Oh, well, maybe if you legalize all of them, you can regulate how much a person can get and you can hold their addiction level down or, or you know, make sure that they don't have cravings so they steal from other people's houses. I mean, that sounds good to me. Uh, we've had these houses broken in twice behind the church and the copper ripped out of them. Probably somebody that's on drugs wanted some money. So now if we just legalized it and gave it to them, then it would cut down on crime. We're struggling with things like this now in America. Something is shaking when it comes to our collective conscience. The resistance to gay marriage was largely fueled by a collective conscience where people just said, this does not seem right. But if you take a poll today, the majority of Americans think that it is wrong. But the majority under a certain age believe it's right. That tells me that our nation is got a collective conscience that is flipping on end like a boat, and it's about to capsize and go upside down. The death of a collective conscience. See, there's something about a conscience. Even though everybody has a conscience, everybody has an awareness that there's right and wrong, not everybody's conscience, we said, was equal. And a conscience has to be informed. What do I mean by that? I mean, when you're raising a child, you have to let them know what's right and what's wrong. You have to tell them, you can't cheat, you can't steal, you can't lie. You have to tell them, don't throw garbage out the window as you're driving down the highway. When I was in Kenya, uh, close to Nairobi, there was garbage everywhere because people would literally throw it at, I literally walked through what looked like a dump on the way to Nairobi because that wasn't part of the national conscience there. And apparently in our neighborhood, it ain't much here either because every week you can walk down along here and pick up an entire garbage bag full of junk because people don't have this collective conscience. They, have not, they were not informed. 
that that is not a right thing to do. So things that are related to morality have been instructed. It is taught to people. Now, since that's the case, the question is, what is it that informed or instructed our national conscience? Because a conscience doesn't happen accidentally. A conscience is built. A conscience grows on moral principles. The conscience in America, the collective conscience of our nation, was established on the biblical, personal idea that you had an accountability to God. And that accountability to God was not Allah. That accountability to God was not Hare Krishna. That accountability to God was not the multitude of gods that was in India. The accountability to God that shaped the consensus of our national conscience was founded upon the biblical God, right. Jehovah. Right. That's the God yeah. that people felt a personal accountability to here in our nation. As Christians, we realize that a key component to liberty is being responsible to Christ. We are personally accountable to the Lord. In fact, you will give an account for everything you do to the Lord in time. We realize that as Christians. That is, it underpins the morality of all Christians. The Bible is very plain. We are not our own. That's 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. We are bought with a price. And because that's the case, we glorify God in our body and in our spirit, which are His. That is the bedrock of Christian ethics. And that was the bedrock of our national sense of morality. That was the bedrock. Let's go all the way back to the Gettysburg Address. Most of you remember who gave the Gettysburg Address. Who was it? Abraham Lincoln. He said that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God, pause. Does that phrase sound familiar? Well, that was picked up and made part of our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. God. What does it mean to be under God? It means to be accountable before God. If you are under God, His authority reigns supreme. That's what it means. Oh, we can quote it and not think about it. But if you want to understand what we're saying, that is what we are saying. Our collective conscience as a nation is built on the idea that we have national responsibility to the God of the Bible. This past week, at one of the gay pride festivals, some preachers were attacked. They caught it on film and it went viral. You'll find it's going all over Facebook right now. Because they tried to steal the signs out of their hands and they were telling them to leave and they were cussing at them and finally somebody literally ran up behind one of them clocked him on the back of the head, knocked him to the ground, and started punching him. What's happening? Those preachers were trying to inform somebody's conscience. They didn't like it. They didn't want their conscience to be informed. They were happy with the way it had been distorted. And in America today, we are watching the death of our national conscience. We are watching it happen. When your death, when, when your conscience is no longer grounded on the morality of God's word, there are consequences for that. There are consequences for that. You know, in other countries that don't have our collective conscience, it's okay to go stone a young girl because she got pregnant, whether she got raped or not, don't matter. It's her fault. And nobody is outraged in the community. There are some Muslim countries that are like that. There are, there are countries like that where 
They will have honor killings for the sake of their families. And, and that's not, that's accepted within some communities. Why, in India, the national conscience over there said you can ignore poor people. Their being poor was their own fault because of what happened in a last life. And so you could just walk by them and, and you know, not really have a whole lot of compassion for them, and that was okay. National, you know, what you believe makes a difference in how life is lived. Consider with me for a moment Germany. Do you realize that Germany was the birthplace of Protestantism? Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses on the door at Wittenberg in Germany, and Christianity had so permeated the culture in Germany that you could not, it would have seemed, pull it apart. But Hitler sure succeeded. Hitler made a comment one time that the only people he wanted to be going to the church was the old woman. He didn't want the church to be able to speak to the nation anymore. Why? He had a different idea for the conscience of that nation. If people tell you that you as a Christian don't speak towards the conscience of this nation, speak all about her. Yeah. Because a voice has to be heard. A voice has to be heard. A voice has to be heard. You see, the conscience of our nation is shifting, but it does not mean that there cannot be revival. It does not mean that God cannot move through Christians and see that life is brought back into what seemed to be dead and perhaps hopeless. It's not hopeless, folks. Not as long as there's a God in heaven. It is not hopeless. When we eliminate God from the national conversation, we lose our conscience as a nation. We lose our moral footing. Every man begins to do what's right in his own eyes. And because of that, laws have to come down that are more and more repressive. I'm almost done, and I know I'm taking any you may have or is that all tied together? <laughs> now we know that they take photographs of every single piece of mail that goes through the post office. They can listen to every conversation. Um, and people are saying, well, what happened to warrants? Well, let me tell you something. When people lose a collective conscience and they're liable to do anything, the only thing left is law. And it's not that it's bringing liberty anymore. It's just bringing safety. And even that is poor at best. That is more best. God has more for us than liberty that's built off of force. He has more for us than liberty that is built off of law. But God wants to speak to our conscience, and He wants your conscience to be conformed to God's word. If you will have your conscience conformed to the word of God then the laws don't even apply to you. They can be screaming all they want. You can't kill your next door neighbor, but you could care less because it's not your intent. The law is meaningless to you. You don't have to be constrained by it anymore. If you would, come on up to the instruments. We're going to have communion here in just a moment. The cross of Jesus still stands for true liberty. Let me say that again. The cross of Jesus still stands for genuine, true liberty. Not the liberty of force. Not the liberty of law. But the liberty of grace. With a conscience that's directed by a renewed mind. With a conscience that's following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. With a conscience that is nourished by God's holy word. Some people, they want their liberty, but they find out that what they get instead is not liberty. It's shackles. The blood of Jesus was shed to break every chain.
to break every chain. To break every chain. Sometimes it may seem overwhelming when you look at what goes on in our nation, but the blood of Jesus still breaks every chain. Our leaders are still worth praying for. Our nation is still worth praying for. Yes. And your voice is still worth lifting. Amen? Amen. Why do we have freedom? <coughs> because of the blood of Jesus. And this morning as our ushers are gathering together uh, to prepare the elements for communion, I want you to understand that the thing that salvation does for us as Christians is so much more than the fact that we just get to go to heaven. It's more than the fact that the penalty of sin, which is death and hell, uh, it can be taken care of, but it works something different inside of us. It renews our mind. It starts creating, uh, changing where we are thinking incorrectly about different things. And when we take communion today, I would encourage you to pray before God and say, God, may my conscience line up with your word. May your spirit be what leads me. Let the power of the blood of Jesus break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. Let's gather together this morning for David Jones. 